Okay, well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Underhill. I'm the supervisor of museums and education at the Museums of Mississauga. And the museums are free to explore on every visit. So um, if you're looking for something fun to do with the family, whether it's in person or online, please check us out at museumsofmississauga.com and have a look at what we've got to offer. Uh, this is uh, should look like what you're seeing on your screen right now, if you're on a PC or on um, a MacBook. Um, we should be hanging out at the top of the screen up here. Um, if you'd like to change your layout, you can just hover your mouse over the screen and you can adjust the layout. You'll see here that you are muted and you can't change that. Um, but if you have any questions, we welcome your feedback and um, Kyle is looking forward to hearing from you tonight and having a great conversation. So please do feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box and towards the end of the presentation. So between 7.45 and eight o'clock, we will start asking those questions of Kyle. Um, if you do accidentally close your Q&A box, um, you can um, get it to reopen. Um, just go on back and find the little Q&A box in the corner of your screen and enter your question in here. Uh, if you're having any issues with your audio, you can change your audio settings under these three little dots here. If you bring that up, you can adjust your audio so it comes out of your headphones or out of your computer speaker, whatever you prefer. And again, if you hover your mouse over the screen, you should be able to um, either magnify what we're showing on our computers or um, reduce the size. So um, if you'd like to get a little bit of a closer look with some more detail, you should be able to do that um, from home. Um, okay, so we also have a land acknowledgement at the Museums of Mississauga. So I'll just take a moment to acknowledge the land on which we work and create. We acknowledge that this is the traditional territory and treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Huron-Wendat, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee First Nations. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and global Indigenous peoples who call this region home today. And we acknowledge all of the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. We acknowledge that these words only hold meaning if they are followed by thoughtful action and a commitment to listening and learning. Um, I wanted to also share with you, although we have um, always something happening at the museums for free admission, um, we did just wrap up a campaign called Walks of Art that was happening all over the city of Mississauga with animated sites um, at Celebration Square and the Living Arts Center and the Bradley Museum. We do still have our walks of art on view at the Bradley Museum. Um, that is gonna go until April 18th at our site. Um, so you can check us out at um, mississaugaculture.ca forward slash walks and actually be able to download a scavenger hunt for the Bradley Museum site. We have two different scavenger hunts that we're offering featuring uh, newly commissioned artworks by local artists. Uh, we have a neon wildlife walk, which features uh, neon signs in the shapes of local wildlife that are um, kind of not hidden, but just uh, placed around the site on the museum grounds at the Bradley Museum. And we also have a maple sap to syrup walk. And it is that time of year when we are tapping our maple trees and collecting the sap and making it into maple syrup. So we are celebrating that at this time. And that's one reason why we've got Kyle here joining us tonight. Um, Kyle is part of a bigger program we're offering right now called More at the Museum's Maple 
And this is traditionally the time of year when we would have our in-person Maple Festival, but with COVID-19, uh, we have adapted our programming a bit this year. So it's more accessible and it's definitely very safe for all of our visitors. Um, we do have pre-booked in-person guided tours of the Bradley Museum grounds. You can learn about how we take sap and make it, make it into maple syrup um, and learn about the history of the maple harvest um, that the early settlers and First Nations would have followed. Um, and we have some online programs as well, including Kyle's talk. Um, and I'm just gonna give a little teaser of uh, what Kyle's talk is all about this evening. Um, so because it's, it's the maple tree season, Kyle is here to talk to us about Mississauga's historic woodlands. I'm very excited for this. Um, Kyle Neal is the archivist from the region of Peel Archives, and he will be presenting historic materials that document the many types of native trees and plants that once grew in abundance in Mississauga. Using land records, maps, annotated survey plans, and other materials dating back to the early 1800s, Kyle will point out some areas in Mississauga where diverse trees and plants used to grow and present records from the 1900s that, there were, that reveal the extensive deforestation that took place here. Um, and Kyle is, as I mentioned, the senior archivist at the region of Peel Archives, which is part of PAMA, AKA the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives. He holds a Master of Information Studies, a Bachelor of Education and an Honors Bachelor of Arts. During his career as a government archivist, he has worked for Library and Archives Canada, the City of Toronto, and the region of Peel. When not chasing down elusive bylaws and government reports, he enjoys keeping an eye out for archival records that shed light on the history of area roads, bridges, and forests, um, which is super cool in my <laughs> opinion. Um, so Kyle, with that, I will pass the controls over to you um, and take it away. Okay, thank you very much. Just give me a second here. Okay, is that coming through okay? Okay. Looks good. Uh, okay, excellent, okay. Thank you. And so thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Um, so as Elizabeth said, my name is Kyle and I'm here to speak to you tonight uh, about uh, researching Mississauga's historic woodlands. And I subtitle that an overview of available records. And so, uh, there we go, sorry. Okay, so in terms of a bit of an agenda for my talks or my, my comments this evening, I'm gonna first take this opportunity to talk about the Region of Peel Archives at PAMA, who we are and what we do. Uh, I then wanna spend just a, a brief amount of time um, unpacking what we mean by historic Mississauga, uh, because it does kind of, um, it'll be important for, for, the, for the next topic, which is of course the exploration of records that shed light on the fascinating history of Mississauga's woodlands. And it is quite fascinating. And then I hope, I don't hope, we will of course then um, take any questions um, that we get um, at the end. I would like to point out though, that um, if you're not comfortable asking questions in this forum, I will provide um, contact information um, at the end. Okay, so the Region of Peel Archives. Um, so PAMA, the, again, uh, the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives. And so we are based out of the old county jail uh, in downtown Brampton. And there I've, I've provided a picture for you showing the, the building. Uh, it does still have all of its original bars. Um, so it, it's quite an interesting place to work. And then on the right, you can see just um, a shot of one of our uh, storage vaults, or one uh, aisle in one of our storage vaults. And so we do have, and I'll get into what we, what we have in just a second. I want to talk about our mandate just, just briefly. And so our, we have a two part mandate. And the first part is to collect, preserve and provide access to records of archival value generated by the region of Peel. And so that's the regional municipality of Peel, um, as well as the city of Mississauga, uh, the city of Brampton and the town of Caledon, plus all of their predecessors. 
And so that is under agreement. And so I just want to stress that we are, um, by agreement, the official archives for the city of Mississauga. And a lot of people uh, don't realize that we do serve that role. And so I love to take this opportunity when speaking to Missis uh, you know, a topic of Mississauga that we do collect those records. Um, in Canada, there is kind of um, a total archives concept. And so what that means is that we also acquire, preserve, and provide access to non-government or private records, um, regardless of media and format, that make a significant contribution to our understanding of, of, the, of this area. And that would, again, uh, for the Peel area, would include Mississauga. So we'll take records in from local organizations, businesses, uh, private citizens, um, all the time, as long as they have, um, as long as they pertain to Peel in some way. And I'll be sharing um, um, some recent donations uh, actually tonight that came in for from Mississauga. And so, um, if I had to, you know, have a um, what you call like the elevator pitch, I would say that we collect, preserve, and provide access to the public and private documentary heritage of the Peel area. And so, if there are, are any people kind of uh, watching tonight who aren't sure about what I mean by Peel, just in, in terms of some context, uh, there we are. We are right next to Toronto, and I just like to point out to people that we are the second largest municipality in Ontario after Toronto. All right. So in terms of our records, and so they they date from 1658 up until about 20 uh, until 2020. Uh, predominant really 1806 to 2010, but that may shift as as records uh, continue to come in. We have approximately 1.5 uh, linear kilometers of records in our holdings right now, but that is growing um, as I speak. Um, there's close to 2 million photographic images uh, going back to, you know, about the 1860s or so. Um, thousands of maps, plans, and posters, and I've just put a couple up uh, there for you to see, uh, some nice bright color. And then an increasing number of born digital and digitized material. And I think the last check, uh, like last week, was 4.7 terabytes is what the digitized holdings are, are approaching. Um, but I'm sure it's gone up because our reprographic specialist was digitizing some microfilm um, even just this morning. So I'm sure it's gone up. Okay, and so that's it for my pitch for the Region of Peel Archives. I just, uh, again, want to raise awareness in Mississauga that we are here and that we are collecting and that we want to tell your stories. And so in terms of unpacking uh, historic Mississauga, I just want to spend just a brief amount of time uh, you know, going over what I mean by that. And so Mississauga is a, a complex combination of, of older municipalities, including, of course, the Township of Toronto. And so Mississauga was formerly known as the Township of Toronto, which caused all sorts of confusion with the city of Toronto next door. Let me tell you that. That's a whole other story. Um, but there's also um, some areas that were severed off over the years. And so Streetsville and Port Credit are the, are the two. Um, they became their own municipalities, passed their own bylaws, had their own council meetings, et cetera, but are now part of Mississauga. But I include them in any presentation I do. Also of interest is the Township of Toronto Gore. And so the Township of Toronto did annex um, the southern portion of, of Toronto Gore in 1952. And so it now also forms um, the complex kind of combination um, that is Mississauga. Um, it makes for some some challenging record, uh, an interesting reference request that that specific uh, annexation. And then we also have, of course, the land that was annexed from Trafalgar. And so that was done in 1973-74, um, adding a small strip of land from Dund Dundas up to the 401. And unfortunately, that area um, is not well served by records, unfortunately, because it wasn't part of Peel until 74. And so, you know, people that were in the, like some of the historians that were studying Peel, which I'll get into in just a bit, weren't collecting from that area. And so, unfortunately, not as much, but we do have some. And then the other thing I just want to point out is I'm not sure how, what familiarity um, the viewers tonight will have with surveying or lots and concessions. And so I just want to take a very brief moment here. And so this map is from, let me just double check my notes here, 1954. And you can see here the underpinning lots and concessions here and they're labeled you know con one con two con three etc and then you can see little lot numbers hopefully on your screen um, going up and so this is important because this is tied to the original surveys and so if we're going to be talking about you know historic woodlands um, a lot of times the only records you know the records that will help you are tied and are using the language of the lots and concessions and so i just want everyone to keep that that kind of grid pattern in mind um, as i go through because that will be that will be helpful 
Okay, so I'm jumping right in now to the exploration of the actual records. And so this talk is stems from um, a blog post that I wrote back in 2019, where I talked about researching the woodland world um, historic vegetation in Peel. And uh, Elizabeth from the Museums of Mississauga read it and, and liked it and asked if I could maybe develop a talk based on it. And so I was very happy, thrilled to do so. Um, I love this topic. Um, very much. And so, but what I've done is I've bolted some more material onto it and have skewed it completely to a Mississauga focus um, because that blog post kind of was trying to draw from all over Peel, whereas tonight, strictly Mississauga. Um, the one proviso that I want to put out there is, is, is I'm, I'm a trained archivist, but I'm not an arborist or a botanist. And uh, I don't want, I just don't want to be confused um, for any of those. And so I, I claim no authority and I apologize profusely for any Latin. Um, uh, there might be a couple of Latin things um, in some lists and I, I cannot pronounce them properly. I do apologize for that. And so what you're really seeing here, I'm also not a historian. And so what you're going to get in the following pages is not a narrative recounting of the history of Mississauga's woodlands, unfortunately. Um, what you're going to see are, um, as we discussed already, records, um, different groups of records that we have in our holdings um, that I think would be useful to someone maybe writing that history or interested in, you know, the types of trees that are maybe in the local park, that kind of thing. And I can point you um, to the right records. So let, with that proviso um, in place, uh, let's jump right in. So let me get a drink here. And so the first group of files um, that I want to talk to you about are the natural history research files of William Perkins Bull. And so these were compiled in the 1930s. And so here's the man himself. Uh, on the left, Mr. Bull, quite, in a, quite in a character by all accounts, very interesting man. And so just the brief bio on him, born in Downsview, uh, Toronto, uh, moved to uh, Brampton or Chincuzi Township at the time, Brampton now, um, grew up in Brampton, actually went to school not far from Mississauga, right on the border, right on Steeles at the time, I eventually became a lawyer and by all accounts was a very good lawyer and, and on the side he became a businessman and an investor. And so where he comes into our story is in 1931, he suffered a very bad car crash. He was very badly injured. And by all accounts, um, he was a very difficult patient. Um, you know, he didn't like being confined to a bed and having nothing to do because he couldn't try law, um, law cases from bed at the time. And so his wife um, and some of his friends, including the chief librarian of the Toronto Public Library, convinced him, you know, why don't you write that history appeal you've always been wanting to write? Because he loved... Um, the county. He was always talking about someone should do a history. And so he took their advice and ran with it, um, but like very like intensely so. And so you can see him here interviewing a resident. This was, uh, maybe this is the only piece that's not Mississauga, sorry, this is Mono Road, but you can see him interviewing with the, with an assistant because what he set out to do was, was a massive research project. He hired um, well over a hundred uh, by our accounts um, researchers or assistants and staff to help him with his research. And so he sent them to, you know, archives all over the place. He had them going through newspapers. He had them going through the survey diaries, which will become important in a minute. Um, he had them going through anything, um, interviewing patients, like interviewing people, taking down like their, their conversations. It was a massive project. It resulted in, oh, I'm sorry, I should mention like any topic was, was on the book. So he researched the military industry, sports, religion, um, natural history, which we'll get into, indigenous um, history, et cetera. Like you name it, they probably had a file on it. And so it resulted in the publication of 13 uh, volumes there on the left. Um, they're interesting resources, they're indexed, they're all available online actually. And I can share that link with anyone who's interested in going through them. But what's of more interest to me are the unpublished, the unpublished material. And so by my last count, I think there were five potential manuscripts that were not published, including the one on natural history. And there's an example there of some of the files. We have hundreds of boxes, just like this, chock full of, of his material. And so the, uh, the unpublished manuscript I'd like to speak to you about tonight is of course, the one on natural history. And so what I put for you up here on the left is the title page to at least one chunk of that. Um, this is the flora title page. Um, I have evidence that he was also gonna do something about the geology, um, but I'm not speaking about that tonight. And for me, uh, when I was writing my blog post, the, the chapter I was most interested in was chapter five, which you can see here, the trees of Peel, which I think by and large was completed. And so I'll be digging through that. What's on the right 
um, is a picture that he that he collected during his research. And it's the only picture that he collected, at least that I found thus far, that was taken as a picture of a tree. Like he, it wasn't like the tree was in the background or the tree, you know, the tree happened to be, the kids were leaning against it. This he took because I guess the owner said, this is a really old tree and by the size of it, it does look that. And so it was labeled large white elm, cotton homestead, Arendelle um, in the, sometime in the 1930s. And so just thought I'd throw it up there. It's a nice picture of a tree. And so into his actual research material. And so the first page of the chapter on trees, I found incredibly interesting because he reveals some interesting things to me anyway. And so he starts with, you know, saying formerly Peel was covered with dense forest, beech, maple, ash, etc. He goes through and he and he reads them out. And then he, you know, makes the observation that the nuts of these trees would have actually been eaten by the settlers, which is something that I never even thought about before in terms of, you know, I go to the grocery store. That's my lived reality. But the, the settlers would have been eating the things off these trees. So that's kind of an interesting point. Then he moved on to state that by far the greater part of the original forest has been cleared. And though, but that you may still see here and there, you know, on the side roads and on the stump fences of the pioneers, a fascinating variety of, of you know, trees, shrubs, and plants. And so I, that's a very interesting observation because obviously the settlers were there to clear land. Um, most of them were making farms. And so where you're going to find the original material is kind of on the edges, on the periphery. And then his third great point um, in as many pages was to just kind of more of an observation, actually, that. At, at his time, it was only possible to give an accurate picture of the trees of Peel at two definite stages. So one, when they were surveyed, um, and in Peel, that's roughly between 1806 and 1819, and at the present date. And so in the 1930s, that was accurate. As you'll see from some of the records, they've made some advances. That means that there's some, a couple of other tools that you can use. But let me jump right into that. And so let's talk about field notes or survey diaries. And so a lot of what is gonna follow is stems from these glorious records. And so I have to just point out, we don't have these in our collection, unfortunately. Um, they are under, uh, under the care of either the Archives of Ontario or the National Archives. So this is a copy held at the Archives of Ontario that I copied a couple of years ago of the actual original survey notes um, or diaries that, that the men were, took into the woods with them. And so you'll see here, this is the one for the sixth concession. I'm not sure if it's east or west, um, but it's definitely in the township of Toronto. And you can see here, if you look closely, and I am sorry that the handwriting, I didn't have time to transcribe it and the handwriting is pretty bad. But in the middle of the first page, you can see that there's a pine ridge noted, right? And there's other, if you look through, there's oak noted, there's ash noted, noted there's all sorts of things. Um, yeah, also swamp on the other side. And so this is where, this is the original record for us. This is where we find out what was going on on the ground between 1806 and, and in this case, this one's 1819. And so if I refer to survey diaries um, in, the, in the subsequent slides, I'm referring to this sort of record. And so what Bull did for us and why we love him so much and, and his, his more so his assistants, I don't think he actually did the work was they crunched the numbers for us. And so they went through those survey diaries. They had a, um, access to the originals back in the thirties somehow, um, went through them and notarized, and pulled it out or whatever. And so we know doing his math across the concessions that maple trees showed up in 93.3% of the concessions. And so maple by far is the, is the, the major, was the major tree in Peel, I'm sorry, in Mississauga, sorry, in Mississauga um, at that time. And then followed by beech, you know, bass, hemlock, and then it goes down all the way to the butternut, which was not found very many places. Um, he also, if, if people are interested, like if, if people were more interested in by concession, he's laid out like all the trees found in the different concessions. And so in the township of Toronto, just north of Dundas, they found, you know, pine, bass, maple, oak, and birch in that, in concession number two. And he does that for, he does it for the rest of the township and he does it for, he does it for all of them. So if you wanted to see Southern Toronto Gore, you could do it um, through this or through, or North or South uh, Township of Toronto. And then he also includes just some kind of neat little nuggets um, that I just, I found fascinating. So one, he actually does crunch the numbers and says that 11% of the, of the original forest remained in 1930. And so I'm not sure, like we don't have his rough math. We can't check his math, unfortunately. Uh, but it is neat that he was able to put a number to it. Uh, we talk, and then he, he's able to identify that three species of elm were found in Peel. And so that's, you know, I didn't even know there were three species of elm, to be honest. Um, but obviously they had found right, through their research that there were. 
And then kind of an outlier, um, he makes an aside, um, a comment about um, the black wild cherries saying that in the 1930s, they've started to cultivate this kind of thing from the wild stock, suggesting that some wild black cherry had survived or had not been totally cleared and that now they were using it to, to fill or, uh, fruit orchards, which I, I just thought was kind of interesting. So you can find this kind of thing um, in, the, in this material. And I should mention, sorry, um, with the elms, he has write-ups for all the different types of trees. And so he'll give you like a little snippet about them and then tell you what their characteristics are, if that's, if that's your thing. And then he also lists all of the uh, tree species native to peel. So it's kind of a great summary if you're just kind of curious about all of the trees um, that might've been found here um, and what their Latin names, and I'm not even gonna try it at this point, um, but he gives in it, the lists are longer than this. I just gave you two of the pages to give you a taste of, of what can be found in, in those records. Okay, and so those are all very textual and I do kind of apologize for that. But if you're more visual like myself and you wanna see what's going on with the trees, he has an absolutely amazing record. And so this is what we call the annotated survey plan. And so what he had his staff do was take a, a really gorgeous actually blueprint of the Township of Toronto. It's oversized, it's really big. And by hand, write in all of the, the tree names. And so what I've done, it's too big to see, I apologize. This um, I've had to pull up this left quadrant here, the upper left quadrant. And so this is the order, the area bordered by you know, Winston Churchill and Steeles. Um, and you can just see that he's gone in it. And if you know the lot in the concession that you're interested in, you can actually point out that there was a pine ridge on it, or there's maple. You see a lot of maple, which is not surprising given what we've already seen. Uh, but there's also, you know, white ash, black ash, um, all sorts of things. And again, it's tied to its lot and its concession. And so it's just a gorgeous and, and great way if you're interested in what was growing in that area, in, in a different area of Mississauga um, during the survey times, this is the, I would start with this probably. And then just so uh, if anyone's from Southern Mississauga, I just kind of pulled up the Lakeview area and I rotated it so you can, so you can read because um, they wrote along the concession lines um, to fit in. So I'll just give you a second to take a look at that. But if anyone's like interested in this map, I can make it available. Um, part of it's online already through the, the PAMA website. Um, but it's an absolutely gorgeous record and also a very useful record. Yeah, I'm just going to keep going. Okay. And so if you wanted to drill down even farther, uh, Bull has helped you as well, because in addition, he's also compiled what we call the annotated land abstracts. And so to explain this, every lot within every concession in Peel is linked to a corresponding legal file. And so what I mean by that is there are, lot, there are books that were held at the registry office that were arranged by lot and concession. And every time a lot was sold or severed, or if there was a lawsuit, or if there was a will, it was registered on title on, and went into those books. And so Perkins said his staff copied those out too. And so I feel really bad for the staff. I think they were very busy. Um, but what he also, or someone instructed them to do, we don't know if it was Bull, maybe it was a senior researcher or whatnot, asked them as part of that copying out to copy over what they had learned from the survey diaries. And so here's an example. I just picked a, a landmark in, in Mississauga. So square one, hopefully everyone you know, has a rough sense of where that is or has at least heard of it. And so if you're interested in what was there during its 1819 um, survey, I can tell you that it was, there was a beach ridge there. There was ash and elm, maple and oak. And so there's also kind of a little uh, tidbit here um, because they also copied in the field notes on the inspection of the settlement duties in the township of Toronto by Mr. Wilmot in 1810. And so settlement duties, I won't get into it too much, but basically if you were granted some land, you, you had a certain amount of time to clear five acres and to build a house um, and to clear the roadway in front of your house um, before you could you know, say the land was yours. And so at the time, Five acres were partly chopped, but the logs had not been rolled into any pile. The road was underbrushed, so it wasn't fully passable. There was a poor log house, an insufficient fence, and there was no person living there. If anyone's curious, about square one around 1810. Uh, Aaron Mills Town Center, just to pick, I guess I picked another mall, sorry. Um, there you've got maple beach, oak, bass, and black ash. And that's actually the first time I've seen black ash um, on one of these, um, looking through these files over the years. And if you're curious, um, that Aerial Sound Center is on lot one, concession six, west of here in Tariff Street. And finally, a Benares Historic House. I had to do something with the connection, of course. 
And this one's actually very interesting um, because on the south part of that lot, it was pine, but on the north part, it was natural plains. And so that's the first time that's a geologic feature that they've noted that there were actually no, nothing growing there. And that's again, the only occurrence that I've seen thus far. And I haven't looked through obviously there's thousands of these pages, but that's, and there was more remarks there um, with regard um, to um, the settlement duties. And it was similar. There was a house built, but not inhabited. The road wasn't complete, et cetera. It was uh, difficult to fulfill those duties, I suspect, from what I've seen in these files. Okay, so moving on to a, a different record, uh, topographical maps. And so we do have a fair collection of them um, in our holdings. And so these maps are, you know, they're useful to the military and to planners because they show you the elevation. And so if you're interested in, you know, drainage or or movement of troops or whatnot. That's, that's what they're really useful for, but they're also extremely useful to us um, for many reasons. Like as you can see, they show the roads, they show the building footprints, and they also show you green spaces. And so the one on the screen I have there is from uh, Township of Toronto, clearly, but you can see Port Credit and Lauren Park and Clarkson um, from 1918. But I really need to make uh, give a shout out here to OCL, um, the Ontario Council of University Libraries, because they have a bunch of these um, maps digitized and online. And the reason if anyone on the call has ever Googled, you know, M Mississauga topographical maps, maps and nothing has come up, it's because they're stored under Brampton. Because for whatever reason, the plates um, or the different, you know, I'm not sure what the technical term is for it, but the, the, the maps and they're all numbered and they, you know, they cross the entire country. For whatever reason, they put Brampton at the top of the map that includes Mississauga. And so if you want to find the Mississauga topographical map, you have to click on, on the Brampton link. I've tested them, they are amazing. And so for example, here is a 1909 example um, from Oakel of, of just a, I zoomed in on a, an area in, town, in the township of Toronto. And I just, as a test, I wanted to see if I could prove that you can track a woodland across time using these maps, which is kind of what I envisioned their use maybe being useful for it, to see how woodlands were changing Time. So I just ran, pointed my finger at the map, picked one, and so there's a, a chunk of uh, green green space not far from the Credit River, just kind of south of the Arendelle Station. And so that's again 1909, and that's Oakle. And so I'm jumped up now to 1925, and this is an example from the William Perkins Bull phone that he'd collected for another reason that you can see some annotations on it. Um, and it's from, and 1925, interestingly enough, is a year that Oakle doesn't have. Um, their coverage is not 100%. Obviously, they put what they have online, um, but this helps to fill in that that hole. And so you see there, that's the same area, but represented very differently. And so on the other one, they had little like tree diagrams almost. Here, you just have green lines. I'm not sure what that means. I would need to talk to a map specialist, and they do exist actually. If, and if you're interested in talking to a map specialist, I can put you in touch with one. Um, and here's a 1951 example from our RPA map and plan collection. So again, another one that Oakel doesn't have. And lo and behold, it is still there. And now it's back to the trees. And so again, I'm not sure if you can make a distinction, if it's making a distinction between grassland and trees necessarily, but it is at least allowing us to track a Greenland um, space through time. And so I think they're um, a potentially valuable record for that, for that reason. I'm uh, moving on to kind of a related record. And one that Perkins would have loved um, if he could have known about it. So the Provincial Soil Survey uh, that was done in 1953. And so the province of Ontario went around and did a bunch of counties um, interested in just kind of analyzing the types of soil they had. And so it looks like this. And I took a picture of the map, again, focusing on Mississauga. And using chemistry, they analyzed the soil and came up with what, what they call tree associations. And so what that means is all of those different soil types there have um, related trees that thrive best there. And they know that through chemistry or, and through you know, their studies. And so if you, you know, you, this in tandem with you know, topographical maps and other material will begin to sh build a profile of what was growing or what could grow anyway, or what best grew in an area. And this, is, this sur one soil survey underpins so much of, of what we know now about um, the forested areas. And so, sorry, and I should mention, sorry, it is online. Um, the map itself is online. Um, that is quite the URL though. So if anyone, you know, is really excited about this map, I can, you can email me and I can definitely send you um, that link. Um, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating um, record for sure. Okay, on to something. So um, 
I uh, am, am kind of like the government archivist where I'm like my specialty um, with the PL archives is, is the government records. And so I love a good government record question. And so one of my favorite committees um, that existed in the past is the PL Reforestation Committee. Um, just a fascinating uh, group with an inter interesting mandate. And so I've decided to pick, uh, just show you three reports, one from 39, 1939, one from 1940, and one from 1957, because they all have something interesting to tell us. And so the first one, the March 1939, um, pretty, pretty, you know, pretty basic business, except for the fact that it reveals what types of trees the county was hoping to plant as part of their reforestation efforts. And so they had identified scotch pine, white spruce, assorted hardwoods, and they don't get into that, but I suspect maple was probably part of that, and red pine. Although red pine was was destined for Huttonville, so it doesn't have a relation, it doesn't have any, um, doesn't pertain to Mississauga in this case. And actually, I'm not even sure, given the next one, I'm not sure if they were planning on planting any of these in Mississauga at that time. At the very least, they probably ended, didn't end up planting them in Mississauga. Um, but it's still, they might have been planning to as of 39, but after they get this next report, they may have changed their tune. And so in 1940, um, I think it's in March, I'm not sure of the exact month, but we know it was 1940. There is a report of the Preliminary Conservation and Reforestation Survey of Peel County, and an absolutely fascinating document. Um, I've, again, it's available online. Um, you can download the whole report, and I highly recommend it. And so it revealed they did some number crunching. So they had some experts come in, and at that point, at the time, Toronto Township was 97.2% deforested of its original woodlands. And Toronto Gore, uh, Toronto Gore was 91.2% uh, deforested. And so the problem that they point out with this is that that means flooding was much more prevalent in the south. And so they close, you know, it only takes a few hours of rain to have an immediate effect on bringing about flood conditions. And so that's one concern they have in the south. And I say the south, sorry, they meant, you know, Mississauga, parts of Brampton, and maybe even into part, like I think probably mostly Chincuzi and, and Toronto Township, but they definitely included the township of Toronto. Um, so other observations they made that the, you know, the land in the south was was relatively level and, you know, was, was basically good agricultural land, heavy, rich soil. Um, but they said that the clearing had also led to drying up of creeks and streams and worryingly at the time, lower well levels. And so like, nowadays, I don't think a low, I don't even know if there's any wells in this particular area, but I can't say for sure. Um, but at that time, they were much more prevalent. And so that's a, a major concern for government authorities if, if the well levels are dropping. And so they conclude um, that a planting program of, is definitely necessary in Caledon and Albion, so the northern portion. But interestingly, they don't, they don't um, say we should start planting trees down in the township of Toronto. And I kind of puzzled over this, but basically it was because they were worried about taking away agriculture. And so at that point, agriculture was a huge um, you know, a huge business and a huge, just a great draw um, in the South. And so they felt it was better to focus on education regarding the proper care and maintenance of the existing woodlots and also kind of encourage people to set up windbreaks, as they say, like um, groups of trees that would, you know, help to protect um, some of the soil from eroding. And so that's what they hoped, you know, Peel could help to do in terms of education. Um, again, I'm not sure if that ended up happening, um, we'd have to dig further into the records. And so the last report I just wanna share with you is a December 1957 one and kind of a depressing, a little depressing. So this is the first example that, or first instance that I find in our records of the Dutch elm disease. And so, you know, it's in the news every year, um, it's beetle that transmits this virus, or this, whatever it is. Um, and at the time, they even said that it is, it is steadily destroying the stately elm of which Ontario is so proud. And so the members of the committee, uh, you know, ended up, they went to McMaster University, there was some kind of conference at McMaster and also somewhere in Niagara Falls, where the methods of control were discussed. And so interestingly, this is again, December 57, they call on the future committee, so the 1958 committee, to take care of this important program. And so I didn't have time to dig into like what work they did, if any. Um, but I think if, if anyone's interested in the history of Dutch elm disease control in Mississauga, this would be a great place to start. Okay. So the Region Appeal Physical Survey is again, uh, just an absolutely amazing document um, for this topic. So it was done in 75. And so it was done um, because it, just a bit of context because in 1974, the region had been created, um, taking over from the dissolved County of Peel. 
Um, and so be, as be, because they were a new municipality and because they had other new municipalities, the city of Mississauga had just been created with its you know, new borders and powers, Brampton and, and Caledon, they wanted to draft a new official plan, like an overarching kind of you know, plan for development and control in the area. And one of the first steps in that is to kind of have a physical survey. And so we love it because it has a whole chapter on forestry. And so they actually updated the soil um, kind of the um, associations. And so I've always loved this map because it gives you a sense, like at a glance, at what types of trees are likely to have grown in the different areas. And so whether you know it's oak and hard maple or soft maple and elm, et cetera, et cetera. And so they used the soil survey that I already uh, shared with you. They also used some other resources uh, from the Ministry of, of Natural Resources, and they used aerial photography. Uh, to kind of, you know, maybe confirm uh, their association hypothesis. And so uh, nifty, and I, th I think this chapter's online, and if not, I can send it to, to people. They also did some number crunching, which I always enjoy, you know, seeing hard, hard facts. And so what you see here is, I've just highlighted the two that are relevant in this instance. So Toronto and Toronto Gore, and the number, and this is 57, that's important to keep in mind. And so the number that I really want to draw your attention to is here. And so in the Township of Toronto in 1957, under forest land, the productive, and I'm not sure what they mean between, between productive and non-productive, but the difference is negligible. The number of acres that they identify is 2,538 plus the 178 that was left in Toronto Gore. And so, you know, that's a much, I don't, I don't know how to gauge if that's good or not. But then if you look at another table, you'll see this is now 1975, the number, it's 2,174 across the board in terms of woodland coverage, the number of acres. And so doing some quick math, uh, that's about 500 uh, kilometers that was lost um, between 1957 and 1975 of woodland area. And I guess, you know, knowing the developmental history of, of the Township of Toronto and Mississauga, that, that makes sense. Like that number is not shocking. Um, but here it is in, in black and white and in green, um, the, the proof that in the pudding, so to speak, that uh, that was happening. They also have, of course, this amazing map. And so this um, uh, shows the existing woodlot cover um, throughout all of Peel. Um, and I've zoomed in for you on the right um, to, to show Mississauga. Uh, but as you can see, there is a disparity um, in woodland cover if you just, if you look at Caledon there. Um, so a lot of it was, was still in Caledon and not so much, but again, it makes sense, again, given development and, and you know, highways and what was going on. Um, it's an interesting record because, you, again, you can zoom in and, and take a look at, at the shapes and see if, you know, if it still exists. And on that note, it has been updated. So this was done in 75. Um, the Region Appeal does have an updated one that, um, from what I can see, was updated, updated last year. And here it is. I just did a snapshot for you. It's actually an interactive map now. So you can actually hover your, your mouse over the, the different green parcels. Um, and have it outlined for you, and you know you can cry, and you can put other layers over it if you want, um, if you're interested in, in mapping what's going on um, with the woodlands currently. Um, I've put the address at the bottom, but again, that's quite a quite a URL URL to copy out. So if anyone's really interested in the modern, in the, in the updated uh, Peel Open Data set on woodlands, I would uh, be happy to share uh, to send it to you. Okay. Uh, so photographs and illustrations. And so um, this one's kind of one of my more tougher categories, but I I think them it's because we have over 2 million photographs in the collection. And so if one wanted, one could spend a lifetime going through them all and identifying different trees or different plants, right? Like one could do that and, you know, all the power to them. That's, that's, that's an, that would actually be an interesting project. And so that's not what I'm suggesting here. What I'm just pulling up for you are kind of just, Kind of my some of my favorite examples of photographs that maybe help to tell a story about the changing landscape um, in Mississauga, and maybe you know get people thinking about what types of photos they might need to answer the question that's gnawing at them, like you know were there trees at the end of the street, or you know what's with that park? Like we do have photographs that might help to answer that, and so hopefully this will get people thinking. And so let's uh, dive right in. There's some inter some really interesting ones here, but I know I'm biased. So this. Um, off the top, I have to say this is not in our collection, and so I do apologize for another bait and switch, but no talk about historic woodlands in Mississauga can be complete without at least identifying this photo, this, this drawing painting. And so this is by Elizabeth Simcoe, 
and it is of the credit river, the mouth of the credit river. And so Elizabeth Simcoe, of course, was the wife of John Graves Simcoe, who was the first Lieutenant Governor of Upper Canada. And so as the wife of a Lieutenant Governor, she traveled a fair, a fair bit and took sketches like basically everywhere she went. She was obviously exceptionally talented. And um, thankfully, a lot of these drawings and paintings and sketches um, survive. And so this one is from 1796. And so this is arguably um, the earliest surviving depiction of a tree in Mississauga. Um, and so this source is the Toronto Public Library. I wish um, it's a plate print from an original. The originals, I think, are either at the Archives of Ontario or Library and Archives Canada, but still just a great kind of, uh, just a great depiction of a tree. I love it. So from that to this, uh, maybe not as, as as sexy or as interesting, but to me, this is a very interesting shot. So this is the Cook family homestead, um, basically near Malton uh, in Toronto Gore, taken by again, William Perkins Bull in the 1930s. And I love the shot because, you know, other farm shots that we have are often, you know, close-ups with the with the actual you know, farmhouse or with the homestead or with the shed with, the, you know, kids playing, which are great shots. And I don't mean anything, but this one you have, you see the whole farm. Like there's someone backed up and got all the farm in its glory in the shot, including the trees. And so obviously that's why, why we're here tonight, we're looking at the trees. And so what's great about this particular property is it's also depicted in the 1877 Peel County Atlas. Um, and so immediately you can do a compare and contrast between 1877 and the 1930s. And I'm not entirely sure about my angles. We might have to sit down and, and actually plot it out, but I'm pretty sure that those scraggly trees left in a row there are probably remnants of the orchard that were depicted um, in 1877. Like I'm not entirely sure, and I can't be, but you know, I think that's a fair bet. Um, the Atlas can be a great resource, but unfortunately like they didn't draw every property, uh, unfortunately. But in this case, we have the two, which is fantastic. All right, so this, oh, sorry, I just need a drink. This is the Reed family farm near the hamlet of Palestine. And so an exceptionally rare, uh, we don't, we have next to nothing on this hamlet. Um, it's just why I wanted to share this photo. And so this is also a good news story. And sorry, this is 1915. And it's of course in the township of Toronto. Um, this is a recent donation, actually. This is something that um, was actually mailed to us um, by a gentleman who knew of these records in the family and knew of us, thankfully, and decided that they'd be better with us. And so he mailed them off to us. And my wonderful colleague, Samantha, has been processing them and knew of a picture that showed a couple of trees. And this, these are just great. I love, like, obviously, the tree in the middle is a lot younger. It looks like it might be a maple, maybe. But the older tree on the right is what kind of grow, draws my attention. That's almost growing into the growing into the fence. And so, again, that, again, given that it's 1915, you know, that's probably not a tree that was there originally. But it's, it's close to, if not, um, if not actually an original. And just kind of a neat, and just to put it out that we do collect records. And this is a, a great example of, of that. Um, sorry, I just wanted to show you where Palestine was for people who are curious. And so this is a great, um, really interesting map that again, Perkins Bull commissioned um, showing all of the historic hamlets um, that existed all through Peel. And so Palestine is one of the ones that's, that's yeah, we have next to nothing on. It was on Dairy Road, not that far from, from here, Ontario. Um, but the one that we have nothing on um, is in the, in the South there. I'm not sure if people can see Dixie. Just north of Dixie is Pucky Huddle. And so if anyone has any records or any pictures of Pucky Huddle, please get in touch. We would love to talk to you. Okay, and so aerial photographs. So we have extension, um, sorry, extensive aerial photographs in our collection. Um, I've decided to pick one here. It's oversized aerial um, showing the 401 overpass um, not far from the airport taken in uh, the Toronto International Airport, sorry taken in 1966. And why I want to draw your attention to it is this. And so what you may see there are what looked to me anyway to be historic hedgerows. And so we can see here that they punched the 401 through, obviously through farmland, because obviously they had to buy farmland from somebody. Um, but here from the air, you can still see remnants of of the hedgerows. And so I do wonder, I would love to know what types of trees were found on those, if any. And I do wonder if they're still there. I suspect not, given that they've widened the 401 now three times, I think. I'm not entirely sure on that. But we do have historic photos. And so if someone was interested in charting, you know, the changing landscape of a farm over time, aerials might be able to, the aerials go back to, sorry, I should be careful. They go back to really only 66, 67. I do know the city of Mississauga though, um, itself um, has a, an older set back to 1954. 
and those are available online. And I can send people a link if, if you'd like. Um, that's a great resource to use in tandem with ours. They work, they work really well together. Um, but if it's a specific area of appeal um, that you're interested in, you know, always you can give us a call and ask if aerials exist for it. We'll be happy to help. Um, just a just a shot that I, I just have to include. It's an amazing shot. And I have to thank my colleagues, uh, Samantha and Nick, for this one, because they, you know, said, what about the stump pulling photo? And so here we have workers pulling a stump out of the on the Lush family farm, which was in Clarkson. And so we're talking about southern the southern township of Toronto, circa 1900. And so given the date um, and the size of the roots on that tree, that is likely an original tree that they're yanking out of the ground there. Um, and it's just interesting, the ingenuity that was required um, to do something like that. And you can, uh, just the, the pulley system and the horses that are involved. I will draw your attention to the man at the top. I don't think that's to code. Like that looks very dangerous. I mean, you should really not be doing that. Um, but just a really kind of neat photo involving trees. Um, not quite as you know sexy here, but um, still kind of neat in terms of looking. So we're looking at the, what they call the highway, which is Lakeshore at this point, the Lakeshore Highway. Um, but you can see the trees are planted in straight lines, and there's going to be something coming up about that. I'm just hinting, foreshadowing something in a bylaw, and I've, I just find that interesting. Um, that obviously the municipal bodies do have to take an interest in that because um, the highways are a public thoroughfare, right? And so there could be um, issues if the trees do happen to not be planted straight or are blocking the road. Uh, but we do have, you know, postcards that, that that serve to document that kind of thing through, I think, other communities as well um, in Mississauga and certainly um, in Peel. Uh, just um, okay. This is just my nerd shot that I have to share with everybody. And so it follows the Lakeshore theme, so it's still on Lakeshore, um, Pleasant Valley tourist and mobile home. Um, and I think that's 1960s. I think is the date that we had uh, done this. But what I love about this photo is the top the top left corner. And so I don't know if you notice there, there's a, a, a row of trees that have been planted along the rail, um, the rail line that's going through. And I do wonder, you know, if that's um, them taking the advice of the reforestation committee and saying, maybe we should plant some trees here to as a, as a windbreak to prevent erosion on the, the bank here uh, where the train is going by. And so, because those are clearly planted, that's not, those are not surviving trees at all, obviously. Um, and even within the uh, Pleasant Valley Tourist and Mobile Home itself, they've obviously done some creative planting. And so, like, you know, since we know the date and it's kind of an oblique aerial, it gives us kind of a neat vantage point. I do wonder what, if any, of those trees survive today. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't done that work and haven't the time, but I, I do raise it as an interesting uh, question. Uh, just an absolutely, to my mind, a gorgeous picture. And so this actually is a postcard that recently came in. Um, of Lorne Park, of the Hotel Louise. Uh, but I'm not, and I don't care about this picture for the hotel or in the cool car. I'm sorry, this is 1930s. Sorry, I should have mentioned that. This is, this is probably early 1930s. I, I love it for the trees and just the just the ambiance of this. So you have a couple, three trees kind of in the foreground here on the left, but then you've got a, like a really thick older tree in the back. And I wish we could, you know, get a better vantage on that because that one looks like it's maybe a little older. But even just for a picture of trees in the 1930s, you can't get better than this, and to my, to my mind, um, just with the ethereal kind of kind of uh, effect that it seems to be having. And of course, and actually, my probably my favorite photos in the collection. Uh, just to out myself as a complete nerd, um, remnants of a corduroy road on the old lake shore. And so, what we have here, corduroy road. Um, for those that maybe um, aren't aware, so when you you know settlers are moving into the area, they're not going to have crushed stone. They're not going to have any of those building materials, obviously, at that time. And so what they would build was a road like this, where you cut down all of the trees, um, hack off the branches, and then lay them side by side on, on runners, basically. And so it allowed you to cross muddy, um, um, swampy grounds relatively easy. Um, I do know there are accounts of people that hated them, just absolutely loathed them because of the, the da, 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 da. and they named after, they are named after the pants, um, corduroy because of the, the, the nature of them. But to my mind, and, and if anyone ever wants to correct me, I'm happy to be corrected, but I think this is the only photograph of the remnants of one. Um, because they obviously, they, they, when they built Lakeshore in 1915, as I, oh, I forget the exact date, they didn't quite follow the exact route of the original Lakeshore. So this is one little segment that got saved, um, for lack of a better word. Okay, and finally, for the illustrations, I just love these. Um, so um, commissioned by, by Perkins Bull again, probably for inclusion in the, the, the published book that never got published. He's got a whole set of these, dozens of just drawings of, you know, examples of the, what was growing in the area. And so we've got here just white birch, red oak, and tamarack. And just, I think, just really beautiful illustrations. 
and again, and, but 1930. So they do show us you know, if there are any changes in the leaf structure in Saga in that time period, that these might be useful for that kind of thing, or just for you know an art project. Like I think they're gorgeous. Uh, but that's it for that. I want to move on to glorious bylaws. Um, and I do call them that. I think bylaws will answer almost any question that anyone has. It's not entirely true, but it's partially true. And this is the button that I wear at work um, often. Um, I heart glorious government records. Um, it, it's a, people get, I get a good chuckle out of it. It's a good icebreaker. And so um, bylaws, again, will answer almost any question. So I went looking to see what they could tell us about the area trees, if anything, about the changing landscape or, or whatnot. And so the first one that I'd like to share with you is from the Township of Toronto Gore from 1880. And this is really interesting. So basically this one is to encourage the planting of trees upon highways, which by this, they mean public roads. But you can't just plant any tree. You could only plant those trees that were suitable for affording shade. And so they excluded willow and apple trees. And you know, thinking about it a little bit, it kind of makes sense because at this point they want, they want to provide shade for the people walking and the horses drawing the, the carts up and down the roads. They don't want apples bonking the horse in the head, and they don't want willows leaning over the leaning over when they start to do that leaning thing that they do. And so I guess that makes sense from a public, you know, movement perspective. But it gets even more interesting to my mind because if a homeowner did plant trees along that portion of the highway, they would receive a reduction in the required statute labor. So at this point, all male landowners were required to give I'm not sure if it was three or five days worth of road labor to the township. Um, and basically that was in lieu of taxation payments. So you, you didn't pay property tax, but you had to you know, show up the three days a year or whatever and help to build a bridge or help to clear a road or whatnot. And so basically statute labor is, forms the, is the beginning of property taxes. And it's, and it's interesting that trees have a, have a role in that story, at least in Toronto Gore. I can't speak uh, to, the other, to the other historic uh, settlements in Mississauga. And so in terms of other settlements, the village of Streetsville passed a similar bylaw uh, let me see, in, I think it was 1880, 1888, yes, to regulate the planting of, of trees on the public highway. And I think they meant public highways. I think that might be a typo. Um, here they don't, there was no mention of apples or willows, so they didn't seem to be as concerned um, at this point, but they were very concerned that they'd be planted in straight lines. And so, you know, calling back to that, that port credit, I know it's separate, but port credit and streets were very similar on their main streets, I would argue. And they were very concerned about distances between trees, especially on Queen Street, Main Street, and Thomas Street. And so I guess my quite, like, I would be interested to know if any of the trees planted under this bylaw still survive. I, I doubt it, but I've been proven wrong before, so I wouldn't discount it. But still a really neat bylaw. And then finally, um, if, you, if you are interested in the history of weeds, um, you know, knowing what weeds were on the ground, because um, they didn't note the weeds, right? They note the trees, but they're not gonna necessarily note the weeds. But in 1920, Port Credit did, uh, because under the Noxious Weeds Act, they wanted to appoint a person who could go and destroy said weeds that they were found. And so they list them in this bylaw uh, from 19, I think it's 1920, yeah, 1921, sorry. And so, you know, poison ivy, of, of course, that's a given, but Russian thistle, sow thistle, wild mustard, lamb's quarters, mullion, sweet clover, and viper's bug loss. I love viper's bug loss. And then they even add some more burdock and ragweed, et cetera, were all declared as kind of noxious weeds. And so they obviously were a big problem in Port Credit in the 20s. And we could go, and I know there are weed bylaws on file for the other municipalities as well, if, if someone was interested in, in tracking that through. Okay, so just onto some recent finds. Um, but just uh, as I was preparing this presentation, uh, it's sometimes funny how serendipity hits you. I found some things that I felt I just had to share that I came across while working on an inventory. And so here we have a functional planning report from Mississauga Road. And so it doesn't sound like the coolest thing, but I tell you it is. Um, Mississauga Road from Dundas Street to Baseline, and Baseline being um, Eglinton. And so you'd expect to find something like this, you know, calculations about, you know, how much gravel they might need, the, the, the math with regard to widening, which is a bit in there. And that's all fine and good. But what it also has is a study plan showing the preservation of trees associated with the Mississauga Road uh, widening. And this is, 19, sorry, this is circa 1970. And so you can see here where they're planning to widen. And if the trees are green, they get to stay. And if they're gray, they're going to get wiped out by the widening. And so unfortunately, it only covers a small, obviously, sorry, oops, sorry, small portion of of Mississauga, but still, if you're interested in you know that particular area, 
this maybe could be an interesting map to show you what was existing on the ground, or at least as of 1970, right? Um, I, I'm not sure if they've widened it again, uh, but I, either way, I think it's I think it's a neat record, and it was unexpected. I did not expect to find this at all. Another one that I just oh, this, this one made me laugh out loud and almost do a little dance. And so, um, I was uh, raised in Meadowvale, and so I'm aware of these pedestrian overpass bridges, and I swear it connects. So um, in 1977. The city of Mississauga was seeking to build a pedestrian overpass bridge over Derry Road. And so Derry Road, though, is a regional road, so they needed the region's permission. And so it's standard that they would, you know, submit and, and, and uh, ask for this permission. And as, as part of that submission, they had to share all their plans associated with it. So we have the bridge plan itself, which is glorious because, again, I love bridge plans. Um, but they also um, put in a planting plan. And I've never seen one of these before. Um, it's... It's absolutely glorious because here you see they're showing the well, and the region, but whoever else is involved with the project, all of the plants that they want to buy and, and the quantities. And then, and that's on the left, sorry. And then on the right, you see where they were going to plant them. And so this is, I, sorry, I have to move this out of my way. Um, Glen Eden Park, which is on one side of the, complete. you can see there the, sorry, the bridge is crossing the road. And then they, there's this nice little park that they're, that they're setting up as part of this construction project. And they show you exactly where they're, they're going to plant all of these trees. So you know where the, you know, Acer Secorums are and the, and the Pinus Negris and the Prunus Sistinas and all of these things are going to be placed in this park. And so this is 77. So it was probably built, you know, 77, 78. I do wonder what's still there. Like, I would be curious. I actually want to, you know, drop by there at some point and see. But the problem is I don't know what these plants are. That would be the only problem. But if someone who does wants to go check to see um, if that landscape has changed since the 70s, we have this kind of thing. And then it makes me wonder, um, it would be a bit of a research project if we have other parks, like other planting plants for other parks um, in our files. And I, I hope, I really hope so. Okay, so I know I'm I just have my eye on time. Sorry, I'm just gonna quickly go through some published resources that we have. And so um, we do have this historical vegetation mapping for the region field. This is actually, and I kind of cheated here, this is where you where you should start. And so if you come to me with a question about the natural history in, in Mississauga, I will give you this. Authored by a team from U of T, a brilliant team from U of T um, that utilizes many of the resources that I've already talked about. And it's just brilliant. Um, I recommend it highly. It's it's a massive read. It's a good read. Um, it's We put it on our blog, and so I can send you that link. Um, Perkins did actually publish one volume uh, with regard to natural history. He segregated out the wildflowers early on. And so we do have that um, available in the reading room. And it's an interesting read. Um, it, you know, you get a, a drawing of the, the, the flower in question and then kind of a description. The problem with this book is that it is lambasted by uh, Jocelyn Weber, who published a book in 84 called The Vascular Plant Flora of Peel County. And so she even says right in it that, uh, well, how does she put it, that Perkins Bull has never, there's no evidence that he's ever collected any specimens and that his lists are so full of errors that they should be disregarded. And so, ouch. Um, I'm pretty sure, I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure it refers to the book I just mentioned because the other stuff wasn't available. Um, the, the rough notes that I've shown you on trees were were, were not publicly available in 84. And then just kind of a, you know, maybe a, not lamentable, but an interesting kind of example here, the S. clenatani gray. And again, I'm sorry, I don't know what type of plant that is. She um, tells us that the only known station for this rare species just west of the junction of Mississauga Road and the North Service Road was bulldozed for a subdivision in 1981. And so she just mentions that and moves on. And so most of this book are just are like really interesting charts that just list all the different types of plants with their Latin name, but mostly this Latin name actually, and then where it was found. And so there, it has like, you know, Mississauga, Brampton, Cal, and it puts a little X and she'll sometimes tell you exactly where, like what intersections. So kind of a good read. Um, it is available in the reading room. Um, it's a harder find, I suspect. And then, sorry, so last, but certainly not least, botanical, uh, botanical samples, botanical samples. We don't have many, unfortunately, but what we do have is really interesting. And so we have a small booklet um, put together by persons unknown. Um, unfortunately, we don't know the name of the person who put this together. We suspect that it came to us via Mary Manning, who was Streetsville's historian. Um, and so we think that she found some way, you know, it came in through her records, we suspect. And so most of the pages are unidentified, but there is one little note on this page and I've blown it up for you on the right, that these specimens were gathered at Lorne Park, May 24th, 1895. 
And so if you want, or 1893, sorry, I apologize. And so if you want to know what was going on on the ground in Lauren Park in the 1890s, this is the, this is the book for you. Um, I cannot tell you what those are, unfortunately, um, but a botanist I'm sure could, if we sent these, um, it's been, obviously we, we've taken a picture of it. We could certainly uh, make these files available to anyone who wanted to maybe chase down this lead. Um, fascinating, of course. Um, the Poetry, we tried to chase down to see if maybe it was original composition. So maybe we could, you know, see if, or if the poet lived in Port Credit, maybe we could, we could link the records together. Uh, no such luck. Um, this is an excerpt from Elegy written in spring uh, by Michael Bruce, who was a Scottish poet who died in the 1790s. So there's no way he would have been collecting flowers, unfortunately, in Lauren Park. Uh, it was worth the shot, though. It was worth the shot. And so thank you. That's, uh, that's it for me. Um, for uh, sorry for these resources, I'm, I'm happy to take um, questions. I hope. And as I mentioned at the top, um, I'm I am giving my email address there. Um, if anyone you know isn't doesn't feel comfortable asking a question, or it comes later to you, like when you're you know out doing some gardening work, and you're like, oh, what did that Kyle say about this? Please feel free to fire me an email. Um, I've crossed out the phone number because at the moment it's not entirely reliable. Um, once we get past this COVID mess, um, it will be, but at the moment not. And finally, sorry. I've just put our Peel Archives blog website there. If you're interested in reading the original blog post, you can find it there, as well as um, other posts written by my brilliant uh, colleagues. So thank you, please please bring on the questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Kyle. I'm like, I'm feeling really pumped right now and worked up. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, look at all this amazing information. I've mm -hmm. been taking notes just frantically. Oh, good. <laughs> oh sorry, yeah, sorry. trying to yes. get it in before. Yeah, so um, we just had one question. Uh, oh, okay. Will a recording be available? Yes, we are recording this. Um, so if you if you miss something, as you know, Kyle has said he's very accessible. Please don't hesitate to reach out to him by email, mm -hmm. um, kyle.neal at peelregion.ca. But we will also be sharing um, a recording of this on the City of Mississauga's YouTube channel in a few mm -hmm. weeks' time. Um, we had, um, oh, we've got a whole bunch of questions coming in now. That's great. So please keep putting them in. Uh, one of the early questions that we got was, um, how did William Perkins Bull fund all of the research, uh, and all of the assistance in the thirties? <laughs> that's a good question. And so, um, that's a very good question. Actually, we could, we could spend a presentation on William Perkins Bull, I swear. Um, he basically was a very was a gifted businessman, and so like he was a good, very good lawyer. He was actually a King's Counsel appointed appointed King's Counsel in 1908. Um, had some land speculation going on, um, but he also had rich friends, and so it was a combination of sorry of people donating to his cause, of some private you know money that he had saved, and also the family had um, a sugar and fruit plantation in Cuba. Um, during that time period. Um, and so a lot of the money came, you know, from, from, from those various um, avenues, but it is a good news story. Like we do talk about, like he, this is the depression, like we're talking about the depths of depression and he's hiring all the people um, to do this work. Though there is kind of a, a rumor that he was laid on his checks. Like um, you might have to bug him and say, you know, I did that work and he would always pay just, you had to kind of remind him. Um, but yeah, Kind of privately, privately um, resourced from 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 those sources, and then he had a couple of friends who donated big chunks of change to it as well. Interesting. Yeah, no, his no, they can make a movie about Perkins. Well, I didn't get even get into some of the details because I didn't want to take up the time. But if anyone's interested in his life story, get in touch. It's fascinating. Perfect. Thank you. Um, one couple said that they would love the um, annotated Toronto Township map of all the flora. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. did find a link to it on the PAMA website in your school yes, resources, uh, but it's not complete. Way? Uh -huh. Yeah, no. So that's um, the school resources was designed to be like, like a, like a segment that teachers could. So we didn't want to overload. Basically, my understanding is they didn't want to overwhelm with the entire map. And so they gave kind of two chunks. And so what I can do, though, if you email me, I can just send you a download link for if, if you want the entire thing as like a massive TIFF file, um, <laughs> like depending on what you want to do with it. Sorry, like if you don't need it super high res, then maybe the JPEG would work. Um, but if it's something you're seeking to print out, maybe, um, which I highly recommend, like it's gorgeous. 
um, the TIFF file might be the best way to go. And so I, I can certainly provide that to um, to the requesters if they'd like. That uh, sounds like an idea for the PAMA gift shop. Um. Uh, if we ever, yeah, if we ever, <laughs> yeah, if it ever comes back <laughs> after this, oh my goodness. I would love to have a- Oh no, I would agree. I think it's it's, so it's it's a gorgeous map and it's useful. Like it's just, oh, it's great. So no, um, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. If there's ever, if when we start <laughs> to have meetings about the gift shop, I may recommend, why don't we get this printed as a poster for sure. People would buy it. Um, mm -hmm. We had somebody just note that um, in that beautiful collection of pressed flowers, um, one of the specimens is a trillium. Oh, okay. Uh, I recognize that as well. So I- I agree. So that's quite lovely. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm guessing. Okay. I, I can see that I now. At first I thought clematis, but I do think it's a trillium, which okay. it's definitely not legal to pick trillium. So don't. Oh, oh. <laughs> Nowadays. Don't nowadays. nowadays okay. like, don't try to copy this. But yeah. um, that's kind of interesting because I, I read recently that a lot of those botanical specimens that get pressed between pages are often just tossed away um, mm -hmm. by museums. Ooh. Oh, um, so it's, bad. yeah, it's it's great that that was kept and that there's. Yeah, well, I can you know not to uh, like if we didn't know that that was Lorne Park, we'd have a problem, right? Like, yeah. like the rest of the book, unfortunately, we just like there are hints that maybe this person traveled a little further afield. And so I'm not even sure if it's all Township of Toronto. And so it's only really that page, unfortunately, that we know for sure. Mm -hmm. um, is is a town is a Mississauga record, and so I can see if the books came in and you didn't know, like the person said, I don't have no idea where these were picked. It's a little harder to justify, I suppose, but still, it's heartbreaking, right? Yeah, there's some those are really yeah. someone went to a lot of trouble um, to press those, and so I'm really grateful that she, he or she, sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> wrote, you know, that where they got where they got them. Yeah, it is a little story from that moment in time. Mm -hmm. so lovely. Uh, somebody says. I walk the park in Meadowvale by the pedestrian bridge. There uh -oh. are still a lot of old trees there. Okay. Okay. So that's that's good to we know. We may have so. to uh, may have to do a research outing. Um, take that map with us and and just go. Well, and it sounds like somebody else here says um, would love to work with your team on documenting these spaces in current times to see how they have changed. Mm. Um, and they are creating a hiking club with a friend and a multilingual tree guide this spring oh, wow. slash summer. So stay tuned. Okay. Um, I don't think that was a private comment. <laughs> that seems like a pretty cool plug. And mm -hmm. um, well, I would just say for that, like um, obviously we'll provide whatever support we can from a records perspective. But like in terms of providing, you know, if you need copies of that, of that amazing, you know, any of the records that I've shown, I can certainly provide that. Um, but in terms of like partnering with people, like the archives, we're really only interested in your records. Like, like we'll give you stuff out, but we're such a small staff that like we, our, our responsibility comes in when there are records um, to be to be appraised and to, and to be kept. Like that's really our role is to be guardians of the records. So we can certainly have those conversations. Um, we can certainly talk about, you know, in nowadays, because everything is digital, um, even talk about, you know, file formats and things for things so that they will be archival ready when they get to the end of their lifespan, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, but we can certainly have those conversations. We don't need to to do that now. Yeah, no, that sounds great. Um, sorry, not not to try to sound harsh, sorry, but I just mean like we are like the archives. That might be a PAMA thing more so. Like if PAMA, the wider umbrella, was going to partner with a, an organization, that might be something they could discuss. Uh, and it's something actually that... Um, our viewers can discuss with me and the museums of Mississauga. Yes, for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm just like, oh yeah, hold on a second. Um, so we have a program at the museums of Mississauga called Open Museum, and it's really oh. about um, collecting people's lived experiences in Mississauga in recent histories. So. Um, oh, okay. We have certain figures that we have collected a lot of artifacts for. Um, or we'll have their books or their diaries, pieces like this that you're showing now. Um, mm -hmm. And like you're saying, we have things that uh, are strongly collected from a certain time period, but we've got gaps in our collection. Um, mm -hmm. So with Open Museum, we're trying to find a way to um, collect community content 
now and going back to about 1939. Um, oh, wow. So if folks are interested in um, some kind of project with documenting these spaces um, and where the trees are growing now, um, please do reach out to, to me. Um, mm -hmm. We're also doing some of that with our parks and forestry department on um, starting to log the significant trees in Mississauga. Um, oh, that's great. All sorts of, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff. We should talk. In the works. I think I've got one by my house. We should definitely talk, actually, like, offline. I, we need to set up another meeting, Kyle, because there's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so, so please, if you'd like to get involved with the Open Museum and, and documenting um, the, the flora in your neighborhood in Mississauga, you can email. Um, uh, well, I think you got my email address in the reminder for this event, but museums at mississauga.ca is a great way mm. to get in touch. Um, okay. Because, yeah, I'd love to hear to actually document these stories and maybe one day they'll end up at the archives. But for now, right. yeah, no, us. that would be great. Yeah. Um, and Laura and Spencer did say as well, how can we get more involved? Um, and I'm not sure there was no follow up to that. So maybe. Um, I don't know. If well, I, uh, sorry, um, I'll take that opportunity to read the question how I'd like. Um, tell all your mm -hmm. friends and family that if they have records in their basement or their attic, and I mean records, so I don't mean to pull away from your mandate, but if they have no, records, cool. maybe call both of us then if you've got records yes. or old, you know. And when in doubt, um, please don't throw it out. Like that is our mantra. And I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, why would you want that? I threw it out. And we cry because we hear about things that were tossed in dumpsters. That that shouldn't have been. So that I'll take that plug. Um, that's how they can get more involved in in uh, ensuring the survival of the documentary heritage of Mississauga. Perfect. And when you say records, you're saying things like written material. Oh, sorry, of course. Maps, yeah. Photographs, postcards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, you've got it there. Like um, the paper. diaries. Pa yeah, paper, photographs, but also you know more and more and more digital. Like if people are creating like records, again, any we collect records in any format. So audio recordings, even. Um, yeah, maps, plants, postcards, those kinds of things. Okay. We don't. The only thing we don't collect is like a lot of people try to give us like old newspapers, and that's the one thing. Unless it's the Streetsville Review, um, we don't. We don't tend to collect it. Uh, we have somebody here, and I just got a little chill. Sorry to uh, uh -oh. go, not segue very smoothly, but um, someone says trees by railway by old trailer park still there. Oh. Oh. Okay, cool. that's okay. cool. North side probably planted by Toronto Golf Club. Trees oh. on south still there with condo buildings. So oh, okay, that's, that's a, neat. That's an outing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have somebody also asked. Okay, um, they're curious about old maps that have the original name of the Credit River. How mm. have you come across many in the archives? And yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. The only other name I've seen for like the Credit River, River Credit or the French version. I've mm. never seen any other name um, uh, given to it. Um, so I would be curious. Um, I certainly don't know of any in our collection that would have any other name other than um, Credit River, River Credit, or, you know, I forget exactly what the French uh, translation is in that instance on a map. Yeah, that's a the really person... good question. Mm -hmm. Um, just I the, I know the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation are doing this research as well mm. right now. Um, and okay. Um, if you're oh, going might... back. Okay. Sorry, I just we might have yeah. a couple of we might have a couple of things for them. They should get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Exactly. Yep. Feel yep. free to to email Kyle directly. Um, yeah. You can yep. try reaching out to Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, you may also want to look back at those older, much older maps, um, like around the, the fur trade period and when the French were here, because they would well, we, they would write down those those indigenous names for things. OK, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, fair enough. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't think any of our, unfortunately, any of our records will. Oh, I say that and then I, we I might know. have something. We might have something. And the Perkins Bowl did research the indigenous history of the area um a little bit and it never got published unfortunately um but there might be something in there um that's a good point oh and there's same question for sheridan creek and i know and 
Sheridan Creek for a while there was called Hodgetts Creek because Percy Hodgetts lived beside it um, mm. and was part of the Oh, Fruit Growers Association. Is that um, Creek? Which side of um, Winston Churchill is it on? Do we do we it know that? On the east side. Okay, so it's just on our side. Okay, so but we might that? have some. We might have a book. There's a book called Place Names of Peel. You probably heard of it, or I've mentioned yeah that. I would check that first. Um, but it's always the question about the original name, like the indigenous name for it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So. That, it could be more more difficult, at least from our records. Um, there's pro it's probably out there somewhere. Um, I yeah. have to give that some thought. That research is definitely taking place. So, um, Mississaugas of the Credit would be a great resource. Mm -hmm. um, last big question: Does the archive collect audio data? Something yep. I would want to see is discussing much older, i.e pre-settler colonial historical records via oral storytelling from indigenous ancestors of the area alive today. Does Peel collect such data and or work with the Mississaugas of the credit? Could we start? Whoa, big question. <laughs> yeah, um, I will leave that to you, Elizabeth, okay. sorry. Like that kind of project would be more, yeah, museums of Mississauga. Um, mm -hmm. I, though I would say we would be definitely open to like, if, if there were like master tapes coming out of that and museums of Saga wanted us to, to take those in, we would, we would definitely, that would certainly fit our mandate, mm -hmm. um, most definitely. But at the moment, it's not like we don't tend to partner in records creation. We're more the repository yeah. after the fact. Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're trying to create these records <laughs> at the museums, um, and kind of fill in some of those gaps that, that weren't collected by our past historians. So we do have um, we do have a few um, oral histories about um, the maple harvest from two elders from the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Um, cool. We were able to go and visit them a year ago, uh, right before the pandemic hit, uh, and take those interviews. Um, and we're in the process of converting them into something that can be shared online, but we were showing the, the interviews in their entirety at the Bradley Museum. Um, oh, very cool. So we do have those, but with the, you know, with, with First Nations, there are, there are conversations that you can have um, and information that can be shared and not everybody wants that information to be recorded or, mm -hmm. or shared yeah. on YouTube, for example. Um, mm -hmm. One gentleman that we interviewed just uh, passed away recently. He was 99 years old. Um, and his son said he didn't want that interview to be published on YouTube. He'd prefer for people to actually go to his community of Curve Lake First Nation and learn about the maple harvest directly from his family. So um, there is some, some hesitancy around um, recording these, these interviews. Um, but you could look at, I think, the Minnesota Historical Society. It's not the Mississaugas of the Credit, but they do have a lot of um, information about um, Ojibwe First Nations um, and the Mississaugas are Ojibwe. So that would be a place to, to have a look. But yeah, thank you for asking that question. We are working on it for sure. <laughs> uh, oh, and uh, Catherine is just correcting me here. She's great. She was with us last week as well at her presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for this, Catherine. Uh, it's not really illegal to pick trillions in Ontario. No. So I, I thought it was. I, did, I, oh. thought so. I thought you weren't supposed to like dig them up and. Yeah, anyway. I lived in fear of that as a kid. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. But she's, she's pointing out that that's not the case. Okay. Um, so, okay, in terms of the resources that you shared tonight, Kyle, um, anything available in digital format that's accessible yep. from home? Um, is there, are, is Tama digitizing its collection or is the best way to get our hands on something just to contact you directly? 
Um, so that's a great question and thank you for asking it. So the collection, um, there's no way we're ever going to digitize it all. Um, this is uh, 1.5 linear kilometers and growing. This is, this, this is just no way. And so what we do is we do targeted digitization. And so as we saw, the, the map has been done. But if you're interested in, you know, drilling down into some of that Perkins material, at the moment, unfortunately, it's it's basically through me or my the rest of my team. Um, and so like what I've had people do in the past, mostly for property research, but I, hopefully tonight there'll be people who are like, ooh, that's cool for, for tree research, is you give me the lot and concession and I go and I just take a picture at the moment with COVID, with how crazy things are, I take a picture with my phone, with my flash, and we set it up as PDF and I, I send it off to you. Um, like, of course, we have plans for rolling digitization, but COVID has just thrown um, everything into, into a loop. But I suspect... Um, that at least like some of that bull material, since it's safe and stable, it's not going to be on the highest priority list. Like we're prioritizing records that are like like ab actively falling apart for, for priority digitization. So the short answer is some, um, but I would say when in doubt, just just email me and I can I can tell you what I can send you. Okay. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Thank you. Sorry, hopefully so it's probably not the, oh of course. I'm sorry, that's not probably not the answer people want. Like I know people want digital. Um, I can share um, with uh, with our listeners here that we are going to be have our OPAC will be launching soonish, um, where you can go and that's going to be an online database where you can search you know, search our holdings, and and if an item is linked, if its digital surrogate is linked, it'll come up in the search and you can click on it and all that. That's coming, but the entirety of the holdings won't be in there when it launches. Uh, it'll strictly uh, we're starting we're rolling out with with some government records and then we're going to be adding to adding to it um, as we go. Um, but in terms of like some of the records I've shown tonight, you might just want to yeah, get in touch with me. Sorry. Well, that's that's very uh, gracious of you to make yourself accessible. Um, well, that's why we're here. Um, it's no point right. keeping the records if no one ever uses it, right? Yeah. Um, but we'll do our best. Like I can't make like if you call me and say I want all of concession five done, like that's not going to be possible. But if you're really interested in say you know your lot, like where you know where your house or your, your condo is or whatnot, I can certainly help with that. No problem. And once the archives reopen, um, it's really, I've been able to go in and spend about an hour with, with that, that Ruben Lush file. Um, oh, yes. So many interesting the, photographs in there. And just yeah. being able to go through and look at his diary. And I mm -hmm. thought, okay, this is one hour is not enough time. You just go down this rabbit hole and get so inspired. So for sure, we will have that opportunity again. Oh, you will. It's just a matter of time, right? Until this yes. darn COVID thing passes. The darn by. COVID thing. I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have a lot of people saying thanks so much. Very interesting and informative. We are really inspired and we'll definitely be in touch through email. Okay. Um, I might try to follow up with some inquiries about the ferns of peel that I saw. It in oh, that you saw it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I glossed over that because at that time I was really focused on trees, but yeah, he's got a, a chapter on ferns. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. That's amazing. So you've really got, um, you've really got our minds tingling tonight. Thank you. Oh, so sorry. Much. I apologize. <laughs> there are a few things from tonight that are also like mm. there's the, the, the forestry, um, the entire, when I talked about the 1975 regional report, all I put that, a lot of them are online through the blog. So if you go to the blog and go to the um, virtual research in the woodland world, there are links there to a lot, to a lot of these resources, but not to like the big ones, right? Not to the, the annotated, uh, what everyone's going to want the annotated land registry files. Those are the most popular series by far um, because it does <laughs> your land record research and it does your, your botanical research. Mm. Oh my goodness. Uh, I'm just scrolling through the Q&A. It looks like uh, folks have wound down with their questions. Just a lot okay. of cues. Um, looking forward to sharing this once the recording goes up. So ah, yikes, um, yeah. Oh, it's so well. You know, fun. I don't, I don't like how I sound on camera. So hopefully, that's great that they'll <laughs> yeah, be able to share it, and hopefully, more people will yeah get use of it. It's great. Yes. So uh, please do reach out with your questions to Kyle.neil, that is N E I L L, yeah, at peelregion.ca. Or um, if you're interested in doing a uh, little grassroots research and uh, taking me up on the open museum project yeah. that we're doing, please email museums at mississauga.ca. Um, but otherwise, I think that's that's it for tonight. Um, amazing presentation. Thank you again so much for all the research you and your team did, Kyle. This has been really, oh, really our pleasure. cool.
<laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you for inviting us. We're always happy to participate. Yeah. Um, well, I think we'll end it there. I'm going to stop recording. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Mm -hmm.